Today on the spot, we are live with all things Microsoft with the latest coming to Xbox Live and an interview with Rod Ferguson for Gears of War 3 multiplayer. Next, we're off to the Microsoft Game Showcase where all the GameSpot editors bring you updates on Halo Reach, Fable 3, Crisis 2, Batman Arkham City, Child of Eden, and much, much more. We're live today on the spot. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the GameSpot Studios, where I am here with Sophia Tong live for a live episode of Tots. Sophia, welcome. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we have a special live episode, Microsoft's Showcase. We were all up there this afternoon looking at a whole ton of Microsoft games. We got Gears of War 3, we right. got Halo Reach, we got Fable. We got the whole list coming down, Microsoft-specific stuff for you. But of course, this is an episode of Tots as well. So we got this week on Xbox Live, we got news, and we got trivia giveaways. Some little Halo books for all you Halo fans out there. Now, yes. What's our other live show feature we got Okay, so today? to prove that we are live, you guys can actually ask questions on Twitter. So if you tweet me at, at Sophia Tong, you can actually send me a question, and I'll check in between segments and try to get your questions answered. Just one word, like you saw spelled right there <laughs> at the bottom of the screen, at Sophia Tong. Uh, yeah, and we'll be checking throughout the show on Sophia's phone, trying to answer your questions about all things Microsoft. Yes, and, uh, so the event actually started last night, Gears of War 3. It did? It did. So I got to talk with Rod Ferguson, um, the executive producer on Gears, and we talked about the beta. And you know that the release date was actually announced a couple of days ago, September 20th. Yay! Excited. Super fun. But yeah, so we have other shooters coming up, Halo coming up later. But first, let's check in with Rod Ferguson and my interview with him from last night. Interview. Sophia here in San Francisco at Microsoft's Gears of War 3 event. I'm joined by Rod Ferguson from Epic Games, and we're here to talk about Gears of War 3. Now, you guys just announced the release date, September 20th. Is that correct? That's correct, September 20th, 2011. And now, the since it's been bumped to September, you said that you're going to have a beta. Now, can you talk to us a bit about the beta? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this was an opportunity for us. We looked at the, the extension of our timeline, not just to be about, oh, like, you know, try to squeeze even more stuff in. It was really more about, let's polish it up. Let's make it the best, you know, Gears game ever that we've ever made. And one of the things we wanted to do is really take that to the multiplayer as well. You know, Gears 4 2 came out a little bumpy at the start. I mean, we, we got through it with our TUs, and, and we, it's a great game now. But we want to hit that right out of the gate with Gears of War 3. And so that's what we're doing this beta on dedicated servers. We're getting out there to, like, people who buy Bulletstorm can get in, all this stuff, right? We're really trying to get that access out there to get as much fan support as we can. And we want their feedback. We want to know what's working, what's not working, and then just also, you know, test out all the you know, having data centers around the world is not something you just want to turn on without knowing if it's going to work right so this is a great opportunity yes dedicated servers is it the key thing and uh, what is included in the beta like maps uh, the modes can you talk a bit about that sure I mean the big thing we wanted to bring is our three new modes so it's team deathmatch king of the hill and capture the leader uh, and, and basically we want to just get feedback on the new modes because a lot of changes and then we're going to bring four maps so in the what you're going to get to play tonight is six maps but we're only taking four so two for sure which is check out in thrash ball and then we want all our fans to go to the Gears of War page on Facebook this weekend and vote for their favorite map of the four remaining, and then we'll put those two in the, in the game as well. All right, cool. So you mentioned the three modes. Can you go into detail about what those modes are? Oh, sure. Well, I mean, Team Deathmatch is really, it's kind of a classic Team Deathmatch, but we did a gear style. You know, the thing we love about Gears of War multiplayer is that really tense ending where it's like two on one and they're hunting them down and you're trying to get away. You know, whereas a normal Team Deathmatch is just sort of a churn to a score, like, you know, like, bing, oh, oh, we hit 50, I guess we're done. You know, that kind of thing. Where we, whereas with Gears, you really have that drama. And so we wanted to get the mix of the two where it's a team deathmatch where you're just trying to eliminate the enemy and it's really simple rules, but we wanted that drama. So what we did is we instead of basing it just on score, we, we gave each team a number of respawns and then once they, they drain out, then they're basically on their last life. And then once they die, they're out for that last little bit. But it gets down to that three-on-one kind of tension. Then whoever wins, wins one round and then it's whoever gets the first two rounds. So instead of it being like score 50 kills, it's win two rounds. Um, so capture the leader is kind of a, we took 
You know, we, when we looked at the Gears of War 2 game modes, we realized, you know, we're starting to splinter a little bit when we were trying to add some a newness from Gears 1. And, and what, what we can actually do is start to bring all that back and consolidate. So you take Submission, which is our meat flag, kind of a human, you know, flag capture the flag, and Guardian, which is sort of our VIP mode, and we put them together into Capture the Leader. So now, basically, you have these two leaders running around, and you, you, you have to capture them and take them as a meat shield and hold them for, in the game right now, it's 30 seconds. And if you can hold them 30 seconds, you win. And so it's a great way, of, it allows the leader to be aggressive because he can't die because he's the flag so it's not it doesn't have that old like i gotta hide kind of feel to it and it's really clear too one of the nice things we did this time is we made the ui really clear like over their head is capture or defend that kind of stuff super so, obvious yeah exactly because we found when people if it's not just shoot the other guy people get confused and so we want to make that really simple and then King of the Hills is sort of taking our Annex game and our King of the Hill, which were our two territory games in Gears 2, and we put them together in one again to simplify. And so we came up with one solid rule set. We have the ring that moves a lot now. So, it's, you know, in Gears of War 2, people could, if they were a really strong team, they could keep the other team out of the ring. That doesn't happen anymore because the ring just moves on them and they, you, can't keep, you can't defend it that long. Um, and so it's just, it's again, it's this really exciting sort of way of going in. It's really great when you get into sudden death and the ring starts moving faster and you got to capture it faster. So it's a fun mode. Now, in some of the videos that we've seen, um, we saw Marcus rocking like a pink lamp. Lancer, and in the presentation tonight, you mentioned a gold Lancer. Now, can you go into detail about that? Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things we looked at is we were really shocked by the response in Gears of War 2 when we did the gold Lancer, you know, as part of the, if you were if you were part of the Midnight Madness, you got the gold Hammer Burst, and if you bought the Limited Collector's Edition, you got the gold Lancer, and the stuff went on eBay, and people were crazy, and we're like, it doesn't, it's just a, a skin change, it's not a, anything changing functionality-wise. But it's that ability to customize and express yourself that, we you know, it really resonates. You see that with, you know, phones and everything else. And so we, like, we really wanted to bring that into Gears of War uh, 3 and so that's what we did we you now not only do you have the weapons we have these sort of we can skin each weapon any number of different ways from really detailed tech you'll see tonight we actually have the ability to have an animated texture if you take the bullet storm lancer you'll see actually flames coming moving on the gun like it's actually animated um, all the way to the color changes like the gold uh, retro and so it's, it's that expressing yourself and we're doing that with the characters too like the coal train we, we're gonna have standard coal uh, and then when we're gears two coal and then you'll actually get to play as thrash ball coal as well right so it's bringing that customization but the Gold Lancer is important to us because it's what you can actually earn in the beta. It's one of about four things you can earn in the beta that you can actually carry over into the final game. Well, you know, so you play right now. You play 90 matches uh, of any of the modes uh, total, and if you you'll unlock the Gold Retro, and so you get to play with it. Now, if you get 100 kills with it, you get to keep it in Gears 3. Same thing with like Thrashball Cole. You play 70 matches of any of the mode, you get to unlock his character. Now, if you play 13 more matches as him, you'll get to keep him. And 13 is because it's 83 on his chest, right? It's going with his number. Wow. Okay, now, so everyone's waiting. When is the beta starting? The beta is starting in mid-April. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we can't be more firm on a date just because we have to go through CERT. We're pushing servers out in data centers across the world, you know, and all, this, all the other kind of logistics aspects of it. So, you know, the beta is pretty close to being done from our development perspective in terms of getting ready to, to give it to the customers. And now it's just about getting through CERT and getting the servers out there. So, but mid-April is definitely the target. All right, great. And then one more time for the audience, when's it coming out and on what platform? It's coming out September 20th, 2011, exclusively on Xbox. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you could come. Go have fun. I, oh, I will. <laughs> and that was a look at Gears of War 3. Now be sure to check back on GameSpot.com for our ongoing coverage. So, Sophia, September, Gears of War 3, we're finally going to get our hands on it. Yes, yeah, September 20th, I'm so excited. But before that, we'll be, able to, we'll be able to play it significantly earlier. Right, so as you know, mentioned in the interview, it is starting in mid-April. They still have to go through some other stuff to be able to find out. Now, I know some of you guys are asking how long it's going to last and like how do you get into the beta other than buying the Epic Edition of Bulletstorm. They haven't announced that yet, so you know, I'm pretty sure that once we get the answer, we'll definitely let you guys know. Definitely. So, like we mentioned earlier at the top of the show, I am answering your Twitter questions. So from Sidburn19, yes, right now owning the Bulletstorm Epic Edition is the way to get into the beta. And from Game Stationer, um, are you guys excited for the Fable 3 content? Well, Tom McShay actually saw that um, today. That's so true. He we will get to out. that. Well, he, I saw him at the event, uh, and so you know we rendezvoused near the table of little sandwiches, and uh, <laughs> he was he pointed over there where they had it on in 3D on a PC monitor, Ooh. and he said it like was really impressive. It, it was very cool, and Tom's kind of a 3D skeptic, so I'm intrigued Coming by that. Coming from McShay, that's a, that's a lot. Yeah, it's true, <laughs> true right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it for sure. That's coming up a little later in the show, but now we're going to throw it over to this week on Xbox Live because, hey, not all games are out in the future. Some of them are out now. Let's see what's out this week. This week on Xbox Live, 
In Arcade, you've competed with yourself for years playing Bejeweled. Why not take on friends in Bejeweled Blitz Live? Try the all-new 16-player Party Live mode and jockey for top position on the real-time leaderboard in both Classic and Twist matches. In Games on Demand, she's dark, mysterious, and uses her hair for clothing and murder. It's Bayonetta. Witches and Angels have had a catastrophic disagreement, and it's up to you to settle the score. With powers far beyond the comprehension of mere mortals and her gun boots, Bayonetta fights countless enemies, evil forces, and giant foes. Then make sure to stuff your jacket full of survival gear. It's alone in the dark. Central Park in Manhattan has gone weird, and it's up to you to get to the bottom of what's going on before it kills you. Wander in the darkness, blowing things up, and wondering why no one else seems to want to be around you. Afterwards, grab a shield, because you'll need it for Bladestorm. Experience medieval war through the eyes of a mercenary, outwit your enemies, or overwhelm them by force. In game demos, mow dragons, mow problems, it's the Dragon Age 2 demo. Think like a general, and fight like a Spartan. With the entire world on the brink of war, you seem to be the only one who can hack, slash, and blast it back together. Afterwards, get ready to laugh with the LEGO Star Wars 3 The Clone Wars demo. Take on epic LEGO action in both space and on the ground. Enhancements include expanded force abilities, brand new weapons, new characters, large-scale battles, and over 20 story-based missions. In downloadable content, Def Jam Rapstar and Rock Band 3 drop tons of songs, and in Video Marketplace, check out clips from Fight Night Champion, MX vs. ATV Alive, and LEGO Star Wars 3. That's all the time we have, folks. Join us next week for more This Week on Xbox Live. All right, folks, welcome back. We have got a special treat for you now. It's the GameSpot News segment, but we've got a real live GameSpot newsman in the desk right next to me, Tor Thorson. Hi. Welcome to the stage. How's it going? Oh, it's going pretty good. So far, so good. So far, so good. And well, you're here to announce some news and show off your like very bright clipboard. My GameSpot orange clipboard, keeping it real. Um, yeah, well, the biggest news, actually, you revealed in the previous segment, was, uh, was uh, Gears of War is coming out on September 20th. The release date, yeah. The release date, and that's a worldwide launch, so that means it's coming out here, Europe, on Austral Asia. Asia, which for our friends in New Zealand and in Australia down under. Um, Oceania. Oceania, yes, pretty much. <laughs> also, then, so then next up is the, um, the beta begins in mid-April. And remember that beta is just, uh, that's only available if you if you bought Bullets, Bulletstorm. Yes, so, so the Bulletstorm Epic Edition, the one with the boot on the cover. Right, uh, right, yeah. that's the one. And th that's all pre-orders of the game or that and most early, or early orders of it. It is a limited edition, though. Right. Um, and they're actually allowing, if you go to the Gears of War Facebook page now, you can choose two of the maps that will be in it. So they actually have voting on it. But oh, they, really? Yeah, yeah. But you have to, they have to let you install a Facebook app on your page if you're, if you're paranoid about that. Nobody's you, life is at stake this time, though? No, nobody's yeah. life is at stake. No. All right, that's good to hear. Also this week, uh, uh, Nintendo announced their 3DS US Day 1 launch lineup. It's going to be 18 games, including three first-party games, which is Nintendo Dogs and Cats. Adorable. Pilot Wings Resort, somewhat less adorable. Steel Diver, more submarinable. Uh, yes, that's uh, a word. Asphalt, Bust a Move, Universe, Combat of Giants, Dinosaurs 3D, Lego Star Wars 3, Madden F NFL Football, Pro Evolution Soccer 2011 3D, Raymond 3D, Ridge Racer 3D, Samurai Warriors, and Super Monkey Ball 3D, The Sims 3, Tom Clancy Ghost Recon Shadow Wars, and Super Street Fighter 4 3D Edition. And so what a lot of those end in 3D, just like they want to hammer it home. They These want, are in 3D. They, yeah, I mean, if the, 3D, the, if the 3DS in the box wasn't enough, they just want to double make double sure, <laughs> make, make absolutely triple sure that, that you, you get that. All um, right, um, and that's launching, 3DS launches tomorrow in Japan. Tomorrow in Japan. And that's that, the, but these those titles only apply for the U.S. launch. Ah. So that will be March 27th in the U.S. Excellent. They might some some might actually come out before then though, so you can actually scoop them up beforehand if you want. Kind of like those PlayStation Move games. They were on shelves before you could actually you play get them. Get the move. Yeah, it's that happens. Weird, but hey, it happens a lot. Um, in other news, Red Faction Armageddon got dated. It arrives on May 31st. Excellent. And that's several months after the Red Faction um, sci-fi television series, which is coming out. That's coming on the Sci-Fi Channel in March next month. So you can sort of, that's, the, the television series is between Guerrilla and Armageddon. It's, it's, yeah, right? that's, that's right. Yeah, it's, so it's, it'll it's bridges the gap. Get you guys all amped up, maybe? I don't amped know. Amped up, I don't know. It's Synergy. Does it have Transmedia. <laughs> <laughs> does, my question is, does it have any mega creatures in it? I don't know. I haven't, I, I, I haven't seen it or played it yet. So anyway, so, but if you're a big fan of the, the Red Faction games, mark your calendars for that. 
Um, Kind of on um, the week started with some kind of accidental news. Um, EA actually posted the site for their new strategy um, studio called Victory Games early, and then they pulled mm -hmm. it down. But it was up, up long enough for the Google cache to get it, <laughs> and um, so they're starting a new sub studio called called uh, Victory Games. It's going to be all all their strategy games under this new label. Okay. It's going to it's going to have it's going to have studios in L.A., uh, Austin, Texas, and Shanghai. And it's it's gonna and their first big project is gonna be a new command and conquer for the PC. Oh, and they're calling it a they're calling it a triple A command and conquer, but that's all they're saying about it right now. Um, it's being headed by John. I'm pronouncing his name wrong, I'm sure. John Van Kenegem. Butchered. 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 Butchered it. Yeah, but he's a veteran developer from NCSoft and Tryon World Network, and he um, also worked on the Might, 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 the Might and Magic franchise way back in the day. All right, those alliterative and titles. So new command and conquer in the works. Yeah, from the Might and Magic guy. There we go. You heard it here. May First. involve wizards? Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Um, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood for the PC got dated for March 22nd. Mm -hmm. And the, big, the good news about this is it's not going to have that annoying always online DRM that Assassin's Creed 2 had. That is a big bonus. That is a major bonus. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that's, so that's going to be good. You can just t turn it on, register it, and play it offline if you want to. Not the always online thing. So that, that's also very good. And last but not least, not really game related, but the iPad 2 is probably going to be revealed on March 2nd. That's next Wednesday. iPad 2? iPad 2. The Apple sent out an invite which had a March 2, with the 2 in huge, and then it was peeling uh, off of an iPad. Yeah, I know. Two. Real. Uh, I can, you can't see the picture, but it's, 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 really, it's really subtle. So look for that. You know, <laughs> yeah. If you're big in iPad gaming, you know, if you want, so that, that'll be something new for you. And that'll be next week during GDC. In the yeah, middle of GDC, and we're going to yeah. be covering the stuff out of, out of out of GDC so we'll next be, week's a big week for you yes it is and uh, cool so GDC next week thank you for joining us here tour no uh, problem and uh, next up we've got a we're going back to the Microsoft games show where I talked to Frank O'Connor from 343 industries about the new Halo reach defiant map pack got three new maps for you you want to hear about them here we go Hey folks, Chris Waters here at Microsoft's February Showcase. I'm talking with Frank O'Connor from 343 Industries about the new Halo Reach map pack. Frank, thank you so much for taking the time. My pleasure. Now let's get right to it, right out the gate. The Defiant map pack, when can people download it? Uh, March 15th is when it's available, uh, 800 points, and it's uh, two maps, two multiplayer matchmaking maps, and uh, for the first time, a firefight map. Excellent. Now let's start with the firefight map. Can you give us a sort of an overview, talk to the folks about what, what excites you about that map? Um, the new firefight map is called Unearth. It's set in a, a kind of abandoned mining facility on Reach, uh, which is uh, definitely talks to the story of Reach. Reach was a, a colonial world, a distant sort of military industrial complex. And uh, this is an exciting Firefly map, not just because it's the first DLC Firefly map, but because it kind of answers uh, a question from we got from a lot of fans, which was they wanted a lot more kind of vehicle-oriented, vehicle-suitable Firefly spaces to play in, and uh, it definitely delivers that in spades. Yes, yeah, so I've been looking behind us here. We see some banks set up, and I've seen people riding around in that Warthog with the missile launcher on the back. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that one of the cool things about Firefight's co-op play is when you when you have multiple people in a vehicle, it's a real force multiplier, and it changes the pace and the cadence of, of your gameplay in the Firefight space, so it's cool. All right, so Firefight fans are looking forward to Unearth. Now, talk to us about not all these maps take place on the planet's surface. Yeah, the, we have another space map called Condemned. It's, uh, it's a little smaller than Anchor 9 uh, and much more dedicated to sort of normal-sized Team Slayer games. Uh, We've been asked a couple of times, why is it set in space? And the simple answer is the space is a big part of reach, and uh, we want to stay true to that fiction. Uh, we have this epic skybox showing the planet burning in the background and showing you what the stakes really are. But also, it was just a, a, the space environment also allowed us to have a little logi area. Um, it'll be compared to Anchor 9 visually, but they actually play very differently. And I'm excited to hear about the, another low G area because that's always fun when the action goes out into space. Uh, now, in the in the trailer for um, in Condemned, you saw a space battle going on, just ships trading salvos. Can you give us, uh, what's the, the, the inspiration for the name? I mean, you're clearly in the middle of the losing battle for Reach. Well, it's called Condemned because the space station there you're fighting on is literally condemned. It's going to fall out of the sky eventually, so you better get your battle over with quick. Um, that doesn't happen in game, I should have. But the, uh, 
The uh, Again, what we wanted people to do is we, we do try to separate multiplayer from campaign in terms of the fiction a little bit, but it's also cool to keep the players still grounded in the universe and the stakes that they're fighting for. Now, the third map also has some, some big ships in the background, some destruction being brought. Tell us about Highlands. Highlands is uh, it's one of my, it's actually my favorite map in the, in the new map pack. I shouldn't really be picking favorites, but it is. I like the big maps. This one has a real Halo 1 feel to it. It's got these big, wide open alpine spaces. And in many ways, it feels like kind of the, the first couple of valleys that you encounter when you land on Halo in the first game. Um, certainly, the skybox isn't reflective of that. There's a lot of action going on up there. But uh, it's designed for bigger, uh, big team slayer battles, big team objective battles. But we have a, a game mode called J-SWAT we play where we turn the motion tracker onto infinite. And you can even play one-on-one. -on -one. It's stupid, but it's awesome. And uh, jetpack around, like, blasting each other uh, and always knowing where the bad guy is. So it's definitely built for big team games, but uh, tinker with the custom game rules and you'll have some pretty interesting experiences. Absolutely. Now, a big team game, a big team map, that means air combat? Uh, yes, it does. It means jacking banshees. Uh, air combat has a, a, a new flavor, of course, in Reach, thanks to the jetpack. Uh, so there are a lot of cool vertical spaces and a lot of s space to play with. All right, so that's the rundown of the three maps you guys are packing in here. Uh, it also comes with some new achievements. Uh, yeah, typically we, we're, we're going to ship all DLC with extra achievements, and uh, it just gives you another reason to play. So. And any other gear upgrades for those people still trying to outfit their Spartans? Uh, you're, you're not built into the... Well, I, let, people should play it, put it that way. I <laughs> I, I'm sure people need, need no encouragement to play the yeah. Define Map Pack. Uh, tell us one more time, when is it coming out and how much is it going to cost? Define Map Pack for Halo Reach comes on March 15th. It's 800 points and, uh, and it's a blast. Frank, so thanks so much for talking about it. Sure. I'm looking forward to getting sitting down over here, folks. I'm going to talk to you later. <laughs> And shortly after that, I went, I sat down, and I played a firefight match on the new map, and I played a team death match. I heard you did pretty well, too. You uh, were, like, glowing afterwards. You're like, ah, yeah, I shot some dudes. I did. It was awesome. Like, I was, you know, to be honest, like, I've been into Killzone 3 lately. I mm -hmm. wasn't expecting, you know, Halo Reach to light my fire that way, but, man, like, right back into it, my heart's pumping. I was headshotting a lot of people, not to brag, but <laughs> it was totally great. And uh, that, that firefight map, driving around on the Warthog with the missiles, mm -hmm. it was uh, explosive and super fun. So exciting that you decided to take some books. Yes, <laughs> seven books. They had them on stacks there, and I figured, uh, I, I can't use many books myself, right. but I know who can, you all at home. We're giving these away later in the show, so stay tuned if you want some of these. Now, uh, Sophia, let's check in. What's what's on the Twitters? Have we gotten any right. more questions? So since we are live, we are answering tweets. So if you want to tweet me at, at Sophia Tong, one word, um, I will answer your questions as long as I have an answer for it. So we have something from 360 Gamer 4. Um, how long is the beta and how early do Bulletstorm purchasers get to before the beta goes public? I'm assuming the everyone that has Bulletstorm and is, has access to the beta, you will be able to get in as soon as it goes live on like mid-April. I'm guessing around April 15th, like somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. So don't worry, you'll be able to get in. And uh, Rhino was asking, limited edition Gears of War 3 console. Like that I don't know, that's something probably they'll announce probably right before the game ships, like I'm any special sure edition I'm sure they'll stuff. have something with like, you know, Dom A pose little. dramatically, <laughs> you know, it's maybe possible. butcher, maybe like one of the new gore maneuvers little figurine. <laughs> and Overlord666 is asking, when is the Gears of War beta going to affect, is it going to affect anything that we get in the final game? Yes, they actually talked about a couple of exclusive items. So the Gold Lancer, which was apparently a hot ticket item back in Gears of War 2. Oh, like, yeah. People were like paying money for that. So this is exclusive to the beta. So if you have access to the beta, you have to play 90 matches of the game to unlock the Gold Lancer. 90. So then with the Gold Lancer, you got to shoot and kill about 100 people. And after you do that, that is yours to keep in the retail game. So that is one Wait, way to get it. After you unlock it, you have to then kill wreck people a with it. Wow, so yeah. you really gotta earn it. Yeah, you do have to earn it. Right. It encourages it's you to play. It's a trophy, you know, yeah. you gotta work hard for it. And if you're a fan of the Coal Train, you can also unlock his Thrash Ball outfit, too. That's cool. Yeah, you have to play, I believe, 70 matches to unlock it and another 13 matches. All right. Now, so as Sophia said, we're answering your questions over Twitter. That's at Sophia Tong. Send 
I'll send a message and we'll try to get to it. This is a live show after all, and not our only live show this week. Tomorrow at the same time, 4 p.m., we'll be covering the J Japanese launch of the 3DS. We got Sean Ricardo and some other GameSpot folks over there now, waiting in line already. I yeah, I think it's raining too, so that should be fun. Yeah, they should be in good spirits <laughs> tomorrow. Um, but we're going to continue on with this show. What's next, Sophia, from the Microsoft Games Showcase? So as we mentioned before, we talked about Halo, uh, Fable 3 That's in right. 3D. So yeah. let's check it out right now. Hi, I'm Tom McShay at the Microsoft February Showcase, and I'm here with Josh Atkins, lead designer of the Fable franchise. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Josh, can, what can you tell us about this? It's, we're seeing Trader's Keep today. Where does this take place in the Fable 3 storyline? So Trader's Keep is the first DLC we're doing that is exclusive to after the end of Fable 3. So what happens is, you know, you start out, you're the ruler of, of Albion, you're a great hero. And, um, you know, we, we, we sat down and we said, what can we make, what kind of interesting story can you tell? What can we make happen? So the very first thing that happens in this DLC is somebody breaks into the throne room and tries to assassinate you. And from there, it's a roller coaster ride across three new regions that players have never seen before, a whole new set of enemies, bigger bosses, um, you know, larger boss fights. So we've done a whole lot of new stuff, really dialed up the action, told a brand new story. So it's pretty exciting. I see in, the, in this demo that we're seeing here, you enter town, uh, Clockkeep, I believe it is. So, so one of the first uh, areas you go to is an area we call Clockwork Island. Right, so Clockwork Island is, um, is what would happen if there was a mad inventor in the Fable world. So it's a guy who's created a whole, you can see right there, a whole set of robot monsters and um, various robot guard dogs, which you can, you, you can actually have your own robot dog, which is pretty cool. Um, and you've got to battle your way through this island to essentially capture this mad inventor. And I don't want to give too much away over the, about the story, because I think it's more fun if you play it. But the idea essentially is there are three arch enemies that hate you as a, as a ruler and are kind of leading a mini rebellion against you. And so as the ruler, you've got, to just, you know, you've got to capture them, quell the rebellion, and then decide how you want to handle each of them. You know, what kind of punishment should you bring down on them? So there's interesting decisions to make, but there's also a lot of action and a lot of traditional Fable combat gameplay. During the course of the demo, uh, your brother's name comes up quite a lot, and he kind of disappeared towards the end of Fable 3. What about part of, how big of a role does he play in this demo? So Logan is, um, I, I, it's a good story, and again, I don't want to ruin it, but so Logan's left, he had a secret, he had a secret base. I'll, phrase, I'll give you that much. And he put his worst political prisoners, it was his den of evil. And those political prisoners are the ones who escape and just, they, they hate the monarchy. They hate you, they hate him, they hate everything the monarchy stands for. And, um, and those three key villains are the ones that you have to track down and, and recapture. Is there a strong good evil component? Uh, does it really branch if you are if you choose the good path versus the evil path? It definitely branches depending on which you pick, and especially it branches on depending on how you choose to punish those those escapees, those those key villains. Because as a ruler, there's nobody looking over your shoulder, right? There's nobody who judges you. You're your own judge, jury, and executioner. So, are you going to be uh, kind? Are you going to basically? let them off and be understanding that they're products of an environment or are you going to be a harsh king queen who basically sentences them all to death for what they've done to to your rule and also what they've done to the people uh, in albion so this follows your choices that you made at the end of fable 3 uh, the kingly choices in regards to like the lake and whatnot so everything is so this takes place exactly as, as you've left Fable 3. So if you've drained the lake and turned it into, uh, into a mining area, if you've made a brothel instead of an orphanage, if you've done all those choices, all those choices are relevant in this experience. Um, and it'll impact the state of the world and all those things carry forward. So all those decisions are consistent across this DLC and the end of Fable 3. And there's, are there new magic uh, weapons, armor, etc.? So one really interesting thing we've done, because we're showing a couple of different Fable things here. We're showing our PC game. We're also showing um, our coin golf game on Windows Mobile Phone. That's a little plug. Um, and the coin golf game has three weapons you can unlock. And those weapons are actually built into the, the pack Trader's Keep. So by playing the Windows Mobile game, you can actually unlock extra weapons in Trader's Keep. Uh, and then finally, when is this coming out and how much is it going to cost? So this launches, Trader's Keep launches on March 1st and it's 560 points. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure, yeah. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, 
docile, like Robo Dog. Yeah. Did you see that? I, sh I should probably finish Fable Three now. And now there's DLC coming out. It's coming out. And uh, did you guys also spot a little cameo? <laughs> Who was in the background there? But Gamespot's yeah. own Kevin Van Ord, hard at work playing. One of the games there. Assassin's he, we got, Creed. Yeah, Brilliant. we've got him on later talking about Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Um, but yeah, Fable 3. Yes. That's DLC for that coming out. Now let's check in with the Twitterverse. The Twitterverse. Wow, I, don't, I don't think I like that word. Yeah. <laughs> you guys can ask me again. questions that aren't just Gears of War 3 related, although I do have a lot of info on Getting a on lot that. of Gears of War 3 questions? I do. So it's I know a you guys are. Title. Yeah. So you guys are asking me, well, Carried was asking me, what is my favorite map? I actually like the two that are included in the beta, which is Checkout and Smashball Stadium. Checkout's like the smaller, like supermarket type area. So it's really close quarters. If you love the shotgun, that is a great place to use it because you can just get right up into somebody. And with the new gun, you can actually just one shot up to three people if you can get them in a group. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty messy. Actually. Yeah, that shotgun has always been really messy, but up to three people? Yeah, you got to get really close. Yeah. <laughs> you probably have to touch them. That is a, <laughs> that is a feat uh, to aspire to. Yeah, I suppose. Now we're going to we're going to shift gears here. We've gone for we've we've covered our shooter bases. Uh, we've covered our robo dog fighting bases, and now we're going <laughs> To like the childhood realm. We're going to talk about our first Kinect game of the show. There were a couple on display. The first one up is called Once Upon a Monster, and uh, it, it involves Sesame Street, which means I'm an instant fan. So let's check out the interview for that. I think Sophia's got more for us on it. Hey everyone, Sophia here in San Francisco at the Microsoft event, and I'm joined by Nathan Martz from Double Fine, and we're here to see Sesame Street, Once Upon a Monster. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much. It's great to be here. So tell us about the game. How did this idea get started? Well, the actually original idea was developed during what we call Amnesia Fortnite, which is a period where we take two weeks off of the game's development that was during Brutal Legend, and worked on something entirely different. But part of Amnesia Fortnite is that not only do you forget about the game you're working on, when you're done, you forget about the prototype. Well, this is one of our first prototypes, and as we went back to Brutal Legend, Tim and I kept talking about it, felt like it was an idea we really wanted to develop. Uh, around that time, we heard that Kinect was coming out. We are like, wow, we've got this very family-friendly IP that's all about new interaction. Connect is a perfect match for that. And then not long after that, we heard that Sesame Workshop and Warner Brothers were partnering. We're like, wow, this is the perfect combination. And that's really where we got today. Yeah, Sesame Street is quite the departure. So now you said it was a family-friendly game. Now how does this work? Uh, well, so it's all about parent-child co-play. Sesame Street, actually 41 years ago, pioneered the idea of a television show designed not just for kids, but for adults to enjoy with their children. And we've taken that idea and made it into all about co-play. So this is a game for parents and children to enjoy together. So the game is structured, it's an interactive storybook composed of chapters. Every story, uh, every chapter is a story about a monster who has a different kind of problem who needs your help to solve it. So using the magic of Connect, you and your children, your siblings, whoever, get together, help Cookie, Elmo, and some other Sesame Street monsters help our monsters solve their problems and make sure that the storybook has a happy ending. Yeah, I was a big Sesame Street fan when I was growing up. I watched a lot of the show. And uh, could you talk about some of the characters and what we did in the game um, in particular in this demo? Yeah, well, so you, you know, you guys are of course not the only ones who are fans. That you know, for Double Fine, this is the first time we've ever done original IP, and there's very few. Or sorry, not original. My bad. It's the first time that we've ever done licensed IP, uh, and for us, we don't take that lightly. In fact, there's very few IPs that we would choose to work with, and in this case, we not only choose to work with it, we're honored to work with it. Uh, you know, Tim and I both grew up. We're children of Sesame Street. There are huge impacts on our lives. Many of our developers really moved. You know, Cookie Monster is one of our favorites. Elmo reaches a lot of new, younger viewers, and we've got some other favorites in the game as well. In fact, we're going to be announcing some more of them as we go along. But um, yeah, we're, if they mean a lot to us, you'll definitely see them in the game. So in terms of gameplay mechanics, um, what are some of the gestures or things that you'll be doing sure. in the game? Yeah, so every chapter, every story is broken up into a set of pages, and every page is a different activity that helps tell a part of that story, helps bring it towards its happy ending. So the, uh, as a family game, we really wanted to make sure that our activities spoke to a wide variety of people. So we don't just have one kind of game and that's it. It's a collection of activities. So we have some activities that are very physical, that are about running and jumping and about accomplishment and speed. We have some that are musical, that are about making music together, and others that are about aesthetic creativity, dress up and 
decoration, and even some activities that mix different elements of those together. So we think that every chapter, every story will really resonate with the whole family, and then everyone will have find at least a few activities that they love and the rest that they enjoy. Very cute. Now, so when's the game coming out and on what platform? It'll be out this fall for Xbox 360 and Connect. All right, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you very much. And that was our look at Sesame Street Once Upon a Monster. Now be sure to check back on the game space for more coverage. That was delightful. It was, and the demo was super cute. I mean, I know it's targeted for kids between four to eight. I mean, it's obviously for a parent and children to play together. So it's like a co-op two-player game. It's like drop in, drop out. So mm -hmm. it's pretty fun. Yeah, I saw they when I I watched the demo, and they were sort of there's a lot of the monsters are waving at the screen <laughs> and sort of really just simple stuff to try and draw you in, which yeah. was pretty clever and. I saw uh, one where you had to, the people had to yell happy birthday. Yeah, so the story, like the one that we played, so it's broken up into chapters. So in this story, it's about this monster who had a birthday, but no one came to his party. So mm. as Elmo and Cookie Monster, you're going to help them like throw this birthday party. So like the first part of the game, like you play as Marco and Elmo, and you kind of run through collecting stuff. And then we jump to the end, where it's like you throw the birthday party. You can even say like happy birthday into the microphone. And then they'll say happy birthday. You blow out the candles and all that. And once you're done, Grover actually shows up in his little <laughs> white suit and starts to dance and then you do like this really cool very basic dance central type thing but you kind of wiggle around on yeah, the screen. Grover's got some moves. He does. And disco moves. The animation was really great like it totally captured that goofy Muppet, yeah. uh, Muppet feel of the actual puppets on the show and I love so it. it seems yeah it seems like really like they're they're treating the license really well. The one thing I will say, uh, the, p the person I watched demo it was yeah. one of those people who was kind of embarrassed to be playing motion <laughs> games. And, like not really jumping into, into it, it, not yelling you know? happy birthday. Yeah, you got to get into it because yeah. you're going to, as silly as you're going to look doing it like super enthusiastically, you're going to look way sillier if you're just kind of meh. Yeah, or like a little hop. Like some people are just like doing this little jump. You have to really jump to get over that log. So That's true. Yeah. Jump I to get over that log. you playing that when it comes out. <laughs> uh, yes, I think that is in my future. Uh, so, that's a, that's a first Kinect game, but we're on to another one called The Gunstringer. Yes, it's another game I got to check out. So, let's take a look at this interview right now. There's a lot of that. Hey everyone, Sophia here in San Francisco at the Microsoft event, and I'm joined by Michael Wilford from Twisted Pixel, here to show off their new game, Gunstringer. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Sophia. All right, so tell us about your new game. It's running in the background right now. So what's Gunstringer all about? Yeah, it's this uh, new Kinect game that's about this undead marionette puppet that you control. Uh, he comes back from the dead after being betrayed by his posse, and you're out for vengeance to try and you know, kill everybody that wronged you. That's awesome. And I see, so it's like a stage show, and how do the controls work? It's for Kinect, yeah. so how's that going to happen? Yeah, so we tried to do something a little bit different with uh, Kinect. We're making a shooter. Um, so you move with your left hand as controlling as if you were a puppet string. So when you move left, the puppet will veer left, and you can snap your hand to make him jump. And then your right hand controls this cursor, and it's a little bit like uh, Res or um, kind of like uh, Panzer Dragoon, where you use your right hand to paint a bunch of targets, and then when you snap your right hand, it just takes out all those targets at once. Uh, and we use, there's a bunch of kind of subtler game mechanics underneath that, like uh, score multiplier and like all the a taco that you can collect that kind of makes you more powerful and weird stuff. But Yes, I've noticed a common theme in all your games. So what's kind of quirky and new about this one? Like, do, how did this idea even start? Yeah, so we definitely wanted to do a Kinect game. And we had a few different ideas for what we wanted to do. But we kept coming back to the marionette one. It just seemed like a really cool thing you could do with Kinect. Uh, and we were actually at a meeting with Microsoft. We're like, yeah, we've been thinking about this you know, marionette game. And they're like, oh, this, that's cool. Let's come back to that. We, we'll be right back. We're going to go to the bathroom. Josh and I are sitting there, and we look up at the, the wall in the restaurant we're in, and it's like this painting of this skeleton, uh, like Old West-style skeleton. We're like, that's our character. So that's actually how it came about. Um, so uh, we finally get to do the marionette game that we wanted to do, and it turns out it's awesome with Connect. So it's a shooter, and how does the story progress? Is it broken up into chapters, or how does that work? So there's five different characters that are part of the posse, and each, when you're going to exact revenge on each of them, there's a, a, each one gets their own play broken up into various acts. So in the demo here today, we have the prologue, which is kind of its own you know, tutorial mode thing. There's only one act in that. And then you, we give you the first act of the first play to play here. 
So acts I see are kind of set up like actual stage like setup. So how did you guys go about like designing like things to go through? Yeah, so we wanted it to feel like an actual stage production. So I don't know if you caught it in the background a little bit, but there's we did this big live action shoot showing how you walk into the theater and it's this awesome theater in Austin, Texas called the Paramount. It's old and awesome. And uh, you walk in that and you see the red the red curtains open and the game begins and all the all the game assets are built to be like out of real world props. Um, and we try to incorporate as much as possible like live action elements. So you'll see you'll be playing along and then you'll see like a giant hand come in and like push a boulder towards you and you have to watch out and it's kinda cool. Yeah, I saw a wavy tube man, like yeah. there's some interesting characters in this as well. Of course. Yeah, we gotta we gotta try and keep it weird. All right, great. So when does the game come out and on what platform? Yeah, so at Showcase we're announcing that it's officially coming to XBLA, uh, exclusive to XBLA and Connect uh, sometime this spring. Right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And that was our look at Gunstringer. Now be sure to check the site for more updates. So I had so much fun with that game. Yeah. The, the whole pew pew thing as a, so you're playing this undead marionette and you're a part of this whole stage show and the set piece is just funny because like everything's like handcrafted, you're just kind of like bouncing along on these strings. I saw he was riding in one point a thumbtack horse. Yes. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, it's all like put together and uh -huh. like the wavy tube man is totally hilarious. So it's kind of weird, you know the whole like patting your head, rubbing your belly kind of thing? It's kind of, yeah. you have to kind of play like that because one hand you're moving and the right hand you're shooting and you have to also highlight the ones that you're going to shoot. Oh, yeah, so you're moving the targeting reticle with your gun. Yeah, and firing. And then moving your yourself. marionette around. So, like, yeah. you're avoiding, like, cacti uh -huh. and all that stuff. So it does take a little bit of coordination. At one point, I was like, oh, no, wrong button. Wait, I'm not even using buttons at this point. But <laughs> it was so much fun, so I'm ca I can't wait for that to come it out. Looks, it looks cl clever. I mean, we, we came back, actually, and we're talking about it in the office, <laughs> and Tom Magrino, our news guy, lit up, and he's like, there's a game like that where I can just do this, like this and it'll have it? He was like, how could that not be fun? I know, and it just doesn't even take much effort to shoot. Um, they said that it was actually registering how far your like, arm goes to your elbow, like that motion. Uh -huh. So I was like, do you have to like point? But I, I think you have to point. No. The well, question is, do you have to say pew pew or pew 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 pew? Either way. That's I probably think optional. That would work. Yeah, yeah, so what's coming up next? All right, so keeping the, the preview train moving, we've got a new game that involves the Ghostbusters. I don't know, maybe you've heard of them or called them once or twice. It's called Ghostbusters Sanctum of Slime, and Giancarlo has an interview on this one. Hey everyone, John Colaverini back here at X11 where I just checked out Ghostbusters Sanctum of Slime, a game in development for Xbox Live Arcade. It's a four player twin stick shooter based on the very popular Ghostbusters franchise, but it's not based on the movies. These aren't the characters that you know and love. These are just kind of fictional characters that you play through in the game. Uh, kind of the twist on the formula is that it's four player cooperative play, but in, in addition to the regular positron glider, you have three other different weapon types, and these weapon types are kind of uh, used for specific type of enemies, and you'll know when to use them based on the types of enemies that you're fighting. So if you're fighting a blue ghost, then you know, you know to need, that you need to use the blue weapon. If you're fighting yellow ghosts, you know that you need to fight, use the yellow weapon, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are 12 levels in the game. Uh, they take place in hotels, uh, graveyards, sewers, that sort of thing. Uh, then there are two specific boss levels, so uh, I guess there are kind of 14 levels in all. But yeah, it's a pretty straightforward twin stick shooter. You use the right analog stick to shoot, you use the left analog stick to move around, and you use the left bumper, the right bumper to switch weapons. Pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, but yeah, uh, check for more on Ghostbusters Sanctum of Slime on the site. Ghostbusters, what up? Yeah, yeah. co-op play and... I saw the one level I watched, they uh, were careening around the streets in what looked like a new, like a Hummer had been converted into the new Ghostbusters. <laughs> of course, a Hummer. Which, you know, let's think, makes a lot more sense than like an old-timey ambulance. I guess, but Hummer, really? Yeah, well, it, you know, it was maybe urban assault vehicle, <laughs> uh, or whatever the That's general possible. category is. You can mount is. things onto that thing. Yeah, exactly, and I, they had it actually hollowed out like an El Camino, so they were all standing in the back zapping zapping away as they drove recklessly through the city. Hmm. So uh, Giancarlo actually has another game that he checked out. That's right, Giancarlo was on to hand, and uh, he's, right now he's writing up these pieces, but uh, we've got another impressions piece from him on Batman Arkham City. He saw a demo presentation of it, and he's going to give you his impressions of that, give you a little details on that title. Coming up. 
Hey everyone, Giancarlo Veronini here at X11 where I just got to check out Batman Arkham City. It's the sequel to Batman Arkham Asylum and the first thing that strikes me about the demo that we just saw is just how much bigger Arkham City is than Arkham Asylum. Uh, it's five times bigger to be exact and we got a really early glimpse of that with Batman standing outside on a rooftop overlooking Arkham City and it's just absolutely massive. And of course, I mean, kind of the first idea that came into our head is how exactly is he going to get around this city in any easy way? Well, the answer to that is any number of different ways. Batman can actually use a, a gliding technique where he can fly around the city. Uh, he can do this dive bomb move where he uh, gains acceleration and kind of swoops back up, which allows him to gain altitude and fly through the air and get to where he needs to go. Uh, you also th see things like helicopters, which you can actually grapple onto and kind of check things out in the city, see what's going on. This is all really important because while there is sort of a main uh, quest mode in Batman Arkham City, there's all these kind of side quests and things that you can do before you take on any sort of specific objective. So let's say you're, you're grappling onto a helicopter and you see thugs beating up some guy outside of this building. Well, you can actually jump off the helicopter, swoop down, slam a guy into the ground, kick everybody's butt, save the guy, and then go back to the main quest. Uh, but as for the main quest, we actually saw a little bit of it in the demo. Uh, in this case, we saw Two Faces kidnap Catwoman. Uh, he's brought her to a courthouse. He's about to kill her. Of course, Batman finds out that Catwoman's been kidnapped by Two Face. He goes to the building, saves her, and then it turns out, as right when he's saving her, that uh, the Joker sort of interjects himself into the picture and tries to assassinate Catwoman. So he tries, to, uh, basically, tries to uh, use a sniper attack on her. We see the bullet come through the window. It hits the ground makes this whole thing become a crime scene, so Batman has to use his detective vision, which you can use throughout the game like you could in the last one, uh, to basically see where the bullet came in through the window, where it hit the ground, and he can measure the trajectory of the bullet and trace it back to where it came from. So you find out that from this courthouse uh, in Arkham City, you can go to this bell tower, this church, uh, you can go all the way over there and see where the bullet came from, you can track down Joker, but you don't have to do that right away. You could stay at the courthouse, kind of explore a little bit more, basically go at your own pace. You can look for uh, Riddler statues, which are scattered all over this place, uh, all over the place this time around. They're in super hard to find spots. Um, but yeah, basically the whole idea of this game is kind of you play it the way that you want to play it. You don't have to rush through and do everything right away. You can kind of check out Arkham City, find out what's going on, uh, do these side quests before you head on to the main stuff. But yeah, it looks really impressive. Uh, the combat looks really fluid. Uh, as it did in the first game, we saw some new attacks, especially, specifically ones where Batman can attack two guys at once. Uh, saw a lot of aerial takedown maneuvers and things like that. Um, but yeah, it looks great. Uh, it sounds great. Um, got a little bit of a glimpse of the storyline, but we're interested to see how it pans out. Uh, but Batman Arkham City is due out later this year on Xbox 360 and PS3. Thank you, John Carlo. Those that is looking pretty impressive. Yeah, that looks pretty sweet. I didn't play too much of the last Batman, but it had great punching mechanics. It sure did. it was very satisfying. Certain yes. games make some things very satisfying to do, and yeah. Arkham Asylum did that with punching. <laughs> looking forward to more of that in Arkham City. Now, before we go back into the more game awesomeness we have from the Microsoft Games Showcase, uh, Sophia and I wanted to tell you folks about something we've got going on here called the GameSpot Spotlight. Right, it's, on YouTube. Yes, it's a YouTube channel, and uh, as GameSpot users will know, we often, you know, we host site videos on our site from users, allow you to upload, but the GameSpot Spotlight allows you to submit those videos to possibly be featured on the Spotlight channel or on one of our live show, one of our shows like today on the spot. So There is filtering. Yes, <laughs> we will be looking through these. It's not just you submit it and it'll be there. We'll be checking it out and you know, send us your good stuff. We want to feature the stuff that you creative, witty, awesome folks have to offer. And uh, if you go to YouTube and search for GameSpot Spotlight, you'll find the page, you'll find the instructions on how to upload stuff and uh, get to it because we really are looking forward to featuring some of your stuff on our site, on, on that on that hub. It should be pretty cool. Yeah, I'm kind of excited to see what you guys have in store. So there are a lot of creative people out there. Yes, and we've already got some cool stuff. So hopefully there's more along the way. Now, up next, it's Kevin Van Ort time. Ooh, Kevin, finally we get to see him. And he was playing Assassin's Creed Brotherhood DLC that involves Leonardo da Vinci. Maybe you've heard of him. It's the second time I've said that today. But <laughs> there's a lot of famous people and or groups of Ghostbusters on the show. <laughs> so, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood DLC, Kevin Van Ord, tell us all about it.
Everybody at GameSpot, this is Kevin Van Ord, KVO here, um, on site at X11. Um, I'm sitting here with Julian at, uh, at, from Ubisoft Montreal, and uh, I've just had a chance to play some uh, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, The Da Vinci Disappearance, and we wanted to catch up with Julian and, uh, and see what this DLC was all about. First of all, Julian, uh, can you tell us a little bit about the concept behind this, um, this DLC and how it fits in with Assassin's Creed Brotherhood? Of course. Uh, well, first of all, the, um, uh, the DLC fits in right after the fall of the Borgias in Rome. Uh, but this time around, we really wanted we wanted to st to position the DLC um, uh, in time, of course, to give it meaning and everything. But we wanted to play the players of and the fans to really experience the the DLC whenever they wanted. So. As soon as you're finished with sequence three, you can play the DLC whenever you want, a bit uh, like a side mission. Um, so, so that that that's for for that portion. And and the concept of the DLC itself is that we uh, it's called the da, da Vinci Disappearance. So of course, it features uh, Leonardo da Vinci. We wanted to give him a bit more screen time this time around. We felt that he was a bit maybe left behind. You were t talking about he was sitting on benches for the whole Brotherhood. So uh, we really wanted to focus this DLC around uh, Leonardo. So he will disappear. And uh, it is the, the Ezio and the, the um, uh, Salai, his assistant, uh, you, you enter on a quest uh, to find him back. So basically, that's the whole, the whole concept around the DLC. All right, so, but obviously there aren't just the old characters. Um, when I was playing, I, w I, I met a new character for Assassin's Creed. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, Da Vinci's assistant? Yes, uh, Da Vinci's assistant is uh, Salai. So uh, he's um, like, uh, Leo is the, is the genius. He's, he's a bit, uh, so obviously he needs somebody to help him out. And here's come, here comes Salai, so I won't spoil too much about about the character because you'll get to, to experience his personality uh, while you play the DLC. But obviously, he's someone that is very young, he's very ruthless. He, he hangs in taverns. He he plays uh, uh, dice games. He gambles all all his money. So he's a he's a very um, big contrast to the more lunatic scientist that is that is Leo. Uh, uh, so he's a bit yeah. Now, when I think of Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, um, where Da Vinci was concerned, I think of uh, some of the more um, interesting missions with different contraptions and things like that. What can we expect in terms of gameplay from the DLC? Well, um, first of all, there is, uh, there is eight new missions, so eight full missions uh, with two new locations. So you, get, uh, you, you, get, you got a preview, you played uh, in Lucretia's Manor. Uh, I won't spoil the details about the, the, the other location because it's near the end. But it's 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 very it's very cool, uh, and uh, you also get to battle with uh, the cult of Hermes, which are basically robe disciples that are track you down and ambush you and everything. Uh, plus, there is two uh, new features that we have. We have a dice game, so you can go in the Merc HQ anytime you install the DLC and play a dice game. So if you didn't feel, if you feel like you didn't have enough money in Brotherhood, you can go there and gamble some more. And uh, near the end, also we have a more of a, of a puzzle gameplay where all the pieces are put together to find down the, the final location of Leo. So that's a new gameplay also that, that we introduce in that uh, DLC. And possibly most importantly for our audience, when can we expect to see a release for Assassin's Creed Brotherhood? Uh, the Da Vinci Disappearance. <laughs> it's uh, very soon, it's early March. Excellent. Well, Julian, thanks so much for your time. It's been fun being here. And uh, I guess I will send it back to the lovely folks back at the GameSpot Studios. Unicorn? Yeah. Hey, so we're back, and uh, what's next, actually? What were we going to talk about? Next up, we have car racing. That's because true. Because we've had a significant lack of car racing thus far on the show. We've had stabbing, shooting, Sesame Street. There, there's actually quite Singing. the variety. Yeah, we need to, we need to round it out yes. with some automobiles. Automobiles, yes. Yeah, so yeah. We're going to check in with our last editor, Maxwell McGee. He's checking out Need for Speed Shift 2, so let's check in with him to see what he thinks. We'll be going to that in just a sec. Uh, so Maxwell and you and I and Kevin, Giancarlo, we all, this and Tom, this place is actually like two blocks away from the office, so we trundled up there. And now all those guys are back there writing up previews. So right. if you want to know more about any of the games you're seeing here, check the site for previews, because they'll be there. And also, don't you still have time left to ask us questions over Twitter. Remember to send your messages to at Sophia That's Tom. True. I am checking. So we're probably going to get to like maybe one or two more questions before the end of the show. We are wrapping up soon. We have a couple of more games. So I think the Need for Speed Shift 2 is now ready. So let's check in with that. 
Hey everybody, this is Max McGee at X11 checking out Shift 2 Unleashed. Now with this demo of Shift 2 Unleashed, the developers are really pushing three new points that they want to highlight in this game. That is the helmet cam, the auto log, and driving at night. Now with the helmet cam, they're really trying to capture what it might be like if you were actually behind the wheel of one of these incredible machines flying down the road at 100 miles an hour. But if you're like me, you'd probably fly right into a wall. So when that happens, your the glass will crack a little bit, your screen will get real fuzzy, sort of impair your vision, kind of give you a glimpse of what it might be like to be one of these harrowing situations. In addition, when you're going to a sharp curve or a turn, the camera will sort of lean and tilt to help show you where you're headed. Aside from that, we've got the auto log. Now the auto log was in the original shift, and in this edition, they're trying to really uh, incorporate it more into the experience in a more streamlined way. So while you're racing, you can see your friends' times, you can uh, compare stats with uh, everybody on your leaderboards, you can see worldwide and regional rankings, you can even save and share replay data with other players. Then finally, there's nighttime racing. And with nighttime racing, they're trying to make it feel more like you're actually racing at night rather than just driving in the dark. So there's lots of little touches, like the headlights from you know, your opponents in the rear. They might catch your rear view mirror or your side mirrors, get in your eyes, mess up your driving a little bit. And just lots of little touches like that. But overall, Shift 2 definitely looks like one for the fans. And it's something to check out on March 29th on the Xbox 360 and PS3. So we're back. So that was Need for Speed Shift 2, his impressions on it. Good job, Maxwell. Race cars, as promised, folks, we deliver. <laughs> uh, speaking of delivery, we could be delivering one of these books to you. Uh, this is our trivia prize uh, called Halo Cryptum. It's a new, uh, apparently, the start of a new trilogy. Really? Let me yes, take a look at indeed. this. indeed. There have been a lot of Halo universe books already. Greg Bear is a new author in them, according to what I just read on the second page of that book. <laughs> um, it's a new su series about the Forerunners, of course. If you're familiar with Halo mythology, you know that's those mysterious people from a long time ago who built the Halos. Uh, so if you want to win one of these, we've got a question coming up for you after our next segment which will be our last of the yeah. day. Yes, so before we get into that, um, we, have, we do have a question we want to answer. Lim Ak asked, what was the game that impressed you most at the showcase? So you kind of browsed around the show floor a bit, um, saw some games. I know we all kind of split up our duties, so we didn't all get to play everything there. Otherwise, we wouldn't make it back in time to do the show. Mm -hmm. But what did you get to see, and what did you like? So I obviously spent some time with Halo Reach, and those maps were great fun. Like, you know, the way that a great Halo map can just create a really fun match, those totally did it. <laughs> and I am now excited to get them. I didn't think I was going to be, to tell you the truth. But I am. Uh, I'm also excited to play the Sesame Street game Aww, because I... Because Elmo's in it. You know, in the, yes. <laughs> well, in the Double Fine interview, they were saying, you know, we're all, we all grew up on Sesame Street. It has a special place in our hearts. That's me, too. I totally <laughs> watched that show a lot. And so even if it's probably going to be pretty childish game. Yeah. I just, you know, I'm interested to see what kind of stuff they do with the Kinect and, and capturing that spirit of, you know, the way that Sesame Street teaches kids to interact with their world. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm really excited for Sesame Street, too, just to see how that'll go. And, like, my nephew would probably really like it. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is that, you know, on top of that, it's also really excited for Gears, two very different <laughs> Two very different games. ones. They both make me smile for different reasons yeah. entirely. <laughs> they, you're smiling when you're saying happy birthday, and you're smiling when you are spearing totally a locust in the, in the back, back with a giant bayonet, like, the... What do they call that gun? That's so it's like the Retro Lancer. Yeah. Now they get to like charge up from behind. It's actually quite hard to do because most people are usually moving around a lot. Mm -hmm. So you do have to get some time and just like ram up. But then you just skewer them, kind of toss them aside like a haystack. <laughs> it's, it's so ridiculous. I think that's why I kind of like it. But yeah. on to our last impressions piece. I got to see Child of Eden, so let's take a look. Okay. Hey everyone, Sophia here at the Microsoft event. I got to check out a few Kinect titles actually. One of the first is Child of Eden, which is playing behind me. Now you guys may have already heard about this game or at least seen gameplay clips of it. It's uh, Mizuguchi's kind of like res, you know, music, lots of interesting colors and a lot of shooting. So all those elements combined in this one crazy package. Now I've been told that the gameplay and the, I guess, mechanics and the controls have been kind of updated. They should be a little tighter. You don't have to wave your arm around as much. I mean, it detected me okay, but it might have been my big coat. I did have to like do some major karate chop motions to actually fire my weapon. Like the way it's controlled, you have your right hand up and you can kind of either do the auto lock 
So you can target up to eight auto lock items at a time and then do one shot to clear everything. Or you can switch to your like auto firing mode and then you're just kind of firing off like automatically, you just kind of hover and shoot things. Apparently there's another mode where you can use a right and left hand and they'll control different things. But you know, so far it looks cool. They're showing off a new level called Beauty and we'll have gameplay clips of that. So it's kind of hard to describe. You should actually just see it. Um, so that's Child of Eden. Now back to you guys at the studio. All right, and we're back. So that was Child of Eden, which is kind of hard to describe because it's just stuff flying all over the place. And yeah, you're, you're did you get to play? With, I did, you know, and around, it was yeah. weird because I think it maybe because of the jacket, um, it wasn't really registering me as well. And they said they have tweaked the mechanics, so we'll just have to see when it comes out. Then. Mm -hmm. yeah. But did so the trailers for that game look? They just look really pretty. Yeah, they're, I think the game for me, I love watching it. I'm just like, ooh, pretty. But when you're playing, you're focusing on like, oh my gosh, I need to target everything and get everything auto-locked and then fire and then do the karate chop motion and I get stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the balance, when you have a game that you need to like, you know, with quick time events or something, you need to yes. be looking for the prompt but also want to appreciate the cutscene or the thing. Yeah, yeah. sometimes it's you just like to watch other people play. One of the perils of modern gaming. Yes, that is true. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're done with our hopping over to the event segments. We've covered all the games from that show. And like I said before, we've got previews galore on, going up on the site every minute. So be sure to check those out. And now, without further ado, the trivia, trivia question. Time. Yeah. So if you want to earn one of these books, get them sent to your house and uh, read all about the Forerunners, answer this question. The Defiant Map Pack is developed by 343 Industries in association with a certain affinity, but 343 Industries is the, the target of the question. Name the Halo Universe character from which that development studio derives their name. So, name the character that inspired 343 Industries studio name. Send us the answer using the module on the page or shoot us an email to on the spot at gamespot.com and you can win yourself one of these books. Sweet. Pretty neat. Don't tweet me the answer. No. No, but <laughs> if you enjoyed tweeting questions today, we certainly enjoyed getting them and you're going to get another chance tomorrow because we're coming back at you live at 4 p.m. That is true. We are we will be live again. Chris and us will be back and we're going to check in with the folks in Japan. They're going to be waiting in line for the 3DS for the Jap uh, Japan launch and they'll have games and they'll do an unboxing. It's going to be pretty cool and we can probably bug them with questions too. Yeah, and we've got Takeshi there to navigate through all the Japanese <laughs> text so that these guys can actually play the game, but it's exciting. System launch yes. from Japan and hopefully we'll have the live connection with them going. So we'll be able to ask some questions and you all will be able to ask them questions as well. Once again, that's 4 p.m. tomorrow. Be sure to join us. And thanks for joining us in the studio today. Sophia, thank you. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. I know. Maybe we should do this more often? Yes, maybe we should. We'll see you tomorrow. Hopefully you folks will join us from the GameSpot Studios and everyone behind the scenes. I'm Chris Waters. I'm Sophia Tong. Saying see you tomorrow. <laughs>